from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about whatever that NASA press release was all about. And if I have time, why do you care about neutrinos and, of course, taking listener questions about all things in the universe? Because that's what this show is about. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. So call 888-581-0708 to join the conversation. In today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about building trust despite junk reporting. But first, the news. Hello, space fans. Welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State, chief scientist at COSI. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today on Space Radio where we talk about all things in the universe. It's a big job, but someone's got to do it. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Studio A of WCBE Radio Columbus. So call 888-581-0708. You can also follow along on the live streams. Go to YouTube, Twitch, website, the whole deal, spaceradioshow.com. Hello to all the space cadets who are watching today, especially the ones in London, UK, Surrey, UK, Essex, UK. The Britons are in force watching space radio today live. We'll take questions that you send there too. Seriously, folks, I've only prepped 10 minutes of show material tops and sometimes not even that. So get those calls in. Before I start taking calls, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news. And the big thing, the big thing that was so big, it just happened hours before I went to record. So I haven't even fully digested this news. And it is news that is worthy of digestion because we are talking about organic molecules on Mars. That is right. Organic molecules on Mars. That is not life on Mars. That is not necessarily the caused by life on Mars, but it's still super exciting. And it's exciting for a few reasons. First off, the definition, organic molecules or organics, these are molecules that contain carbon. So if you've got some carbon floating around in your molecule, congratulations, you have an organic molecule complex organic molecules with lots of carbon attached to lots of other cool stuff is very, very interesting because there aren't a lot of processes in the universe that can create and assemble complex organic molecules. Life itself is one. Our biological processes both use and reform and reshape organic molecules, complex organic molecules. There are some chemical processes that also generate some kinds of organic molecules. And the big announcement here is we found some on Mars. The NASA's Curiosity rover, which is tooling around the Gale Crater on Mars, turns out three billion years ago, the Gale Crater was flooded with water. It was a giant lake, possibly even an ocean. It depends on who you ask. And at the bottom of this lake, just like at the bottom of lakes on Earth, there are sediments, there are rocks that can only be formed from the presence of water. And the Curiosity rover uh, has a drill. It was broken for a while. They fixed it again. They were able to drill down, not far, like a few centimeters, Take a sample, bring it back up into the rover, blast it with a furnace, figure out what it's made of. And it's made of organic molecules. And this opens up so many questions. Questions like, how in the world did organic molecules get there under the surface of Mars? Another question, how in the world did organic molecules survive 3 billion years for us to be able to detect it? The answer to both questions is we don't know, of course. Uh, but this it's just so fascinating. Like, one, because there's some hints of not necessarily life, but the building blocks of life are there in the, in the soil, in the dirt of Mars. How cool is that? And even if there's no life on Mars today, if there was life on Mars in the past, then there is definitely, definitely, definitely a process by which it might be preserved or remnants of it or evidence or traces of it might be preserved 
to the present day. Because if these very fragile, complex organic molecules can survive 3 billion years, buried just a couple inches underneath the surface of Mars, other things could survive, which is very exciting for follow-up missions that we might have a hint, a chance of detecting maybe not life because, you know, Mars is kind of dead nowadays, but maybe the evidence of past life. What generated these organic molecules was a chemical, was a biological, we don't know. We need more work, but this is a very exciting discovery. It's just one more step in our scientific pursuit for the hunt for life outside of the Earth. But that's the latest and greatest when it comes to space. Uh, let's have a conversation. And it's so funny because my other topic that I was going to address today was all about neutrinos and this result that came out uh, earlier this week. And it just so happened P the space cadets on the chat, especially 0132132 uh, and a couple others were asking about like this neutrino story. They wanted me to talk about it anyway. So what a perfect confluence of intention of wanting to talk about this topic. And if you follow space news or physics news or science news, then you may have heard that a new kind of neutrino was discovered. Here's the thing. That result is probably bogus. Not as It's not like bogus. It's not like fake news. It's not junk news. It's just the result is probably wrong. They didn't discover a new kind of neutrino. But that only matters to like probably less than 1% of you. 99% of you who are listening don't even know what I'm talking about. And that's great because I would like to introduce you to neutrinos. I want you and neutrinos to get to know each other have a chat over coffee, get familiar with it. You don't have to be best friends. You don't have to go on a date. I would just like you to be acquainted with neutrinos because neutrinos are a fascinating area of modern science. First off, a neutrino is a kind of particle. You might be familiar with, say, electrons or protons or maybe even quarks or muons. There's a whole zoo of particles out there. These particles are the building blocks of everything. You are made of organs. Your organs are made of tissues. Your tissues are made of cells. Your cells are made of molecules like complex organic and these molecules are made of atoms. The atoms are made of particles. The particles are made. That's it. It just, it just goes down to particles as far as we can tell. Neutrinos are a very cool kind of particle. Part of these neutrinos don't interact. They don't talk. They don't, they don't interfere or bump up against or rub up against or just just have any sort of communication with normal matter. Have you ever seen, like you're walking down the street and you and you see someone across the street or coming down the sidewalk or in the store or something and you really don't want to talk to them? Like maybe it's an ex-lover. Maybe it's Greg, the producer of Space Ray. Like I wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to talk to him. It, you know, it, you know it's, it's like you don't want this right now. And so what do you do? You, like you, you stare at the floor and you pretend if they don't see me, I don't see them. If they don't see me, I don't see them. I'm just going to keep on moving. I'm going to pretend they're not there. I'm not going to interact with them. You in that moment are perfectly mimicking a neutrino. Neutrinos hardly ever talk to normal matter. You can hold, check, this is, this is one of these amazing, mind-blowing facts that I think everyone on the planet needs, needs to know because it's a great entry point into the wonderful, weird world of particle physics. If you were to take your thumb and hold it up in the direction of the sun, just take it, like, look for the sun, and I don't care if you're in public right now, if you're riding the bus, you're in a car, do it, and it's for science, it's cool, we can all do it together. Hold up your thumb in the direction of the sun, and look at your thumbnail. Look at the area of your thumbnail. Neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactions. Our sun is a gigantic nuclear reactor. It is pumping out neutrinos like crazy, the amount of neutrinos passing through your thumbnail right now that are caused by the sun, that are generated in the core of the sun, is around a billion per second. That is billion with a B, classic Sagan billion, billion neutrinos passing through your thumbnail every single second. And that's just the ones generated by the sun. 
There's a lot more sources of neutrinos out there, including nuclear reactors, nuclear decay, decay. These all generate their own neutrinos. We are flooded by neutrinos, but they hardly ever interact with normal matter, so we miss them most of the time. You need gigantic, fancy detectors to occasionally get a chance interaction. They do interact through what's called the weak nuclear force, and so we do have available ways to see neutrinos. There are three known kinds of neutrinos. I'll give you their names just so you know for reference. Feel free to write it down for later. Save it for, for safekeeping. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. they are also anti-neutrinos, and so there's a family of neutrinos hanging out there, and we don't fully understand neutrinos. That's the basic statement here. We don't fully understand neutrinos. We don't fully understand their properties, why they have the certain properties they do. They have a little bit of mass. We're not exactly sure why. Some models of trying to understand pin down neutrino properties predict a fourth neutrino as if three weren't enough. Maybe there's a fourth called a sterile neutrino for reasons that I'm definitely not going to get into. This idea is not new. It's about 20, 30 years old. People have been trying 20, 30 years to find sterile neutrinos. This result claims to find a sterile neutrino. More likely, they just screwed up their analysis. I talked to some people in the neutrino community. Yes, there, there's whole communities so, uh, about neutrinos, uh, especially here at The Ohio State University, where I'm proud to say we're a leader in neutrino research. And yeah. It's, it's going to go away. It's not a significant result. But neutrinos themselves are exciting because if we can understand neutrinos better, we can understand the fundamental building blocks of the universe better. Don't forget. By the way, you're listening to Space Radio, and we got to take a break. And I'll tell you who how you can support the show after the break. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got another Space Cadet question lined up, ready to go. But I do want to tell you that this show is brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can keep this show going. Keep Greg and his family fed. He is looking, he's looking gaunty lately, and he could use a snack. I bought him lunch today, but that was only one meal. He needs a lot more. Patreon.com slash PM Sutter. There was a question from the Space Cadets, uh, Raj Luthra, on YouTube asking about can neutrinos be used as a power source or a method of propulsion to explore space? Is it, you know, are neutrinos useful? Can we exploit neutrinos? And the answer is basically no except for very one interesting way that I'll get into. Neutrinos have barely any mass. All right, they are, you know, it's, it's like their mass is so incredibly insignificant that for a long time that we thought they had zero mass. And then the past few decades, we realized that, oh, they have a little bit of mass. And that was a surprise to everybody. And they're small, they're tiny, they have barely any mass. They travel close to the speed of light, which means if you could build a neutrino gun that could shoot out neutrinos, it's not going to shove you around. Or a neutrino rocket, and you blast it out at trillions upon trillions of neutrinos out the back end of your rocket, you're basically not going to move anywhere because they have barely any momentum. So neutrinos aren't going to be useful for propulsion. They're not going to be useful for uh, as a power source. They just... They can transport energy from place to place, but they don't really participate in any, I should say, they do participate in nuclear reactions, but they don't do so in a way that we can capture and harness them as an energy source. But one part, possibly, possibly interesting thing we can use neutrinos for is communication. Because neutrinos flood the universe and barely interact with normal matter. If I wanted to say, like, say I wanted to send a message to the opposite side of the galaxy and I had a flashlight, a really large flashlight, and I started blinking it, you know, Morse code, intergalactic Morse code here, that light would have to pass through gas and dust and debris. It would get scattered. It would get, it, it 
frequencies will get all shifted around. If I wanted to send a radio message, the radio message will get all scrambled. There's a lot of interference because galaxies are pretty busy places full of lots of junk. But a neutrino, since it barely interacts with matter, only through the weak nuclear force, will just go, just flies on through. We saw a great example of this, a great in a supernova, in supernova 1987A, which by the naming convention, this was the first supernova detected in 1987. Supernova 1987A was the first supernova that we are able, we were able to see both in neutrinos and in visible light. And we saw the neutrino signal because that supernova had lots released lots of energy, lots of complex nuclear reactions, released a lot of neutrinos in addition to a lot of light. We got the neutrino signal first. Not because neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light. Don't stress out about that but because neutrinos could just sail on through the intergalactic wheel, just, just go by and then they reach our detectors and we can spot it. That's interesting for communication. That's interesting for long distance communication. If you can send a signal that you know will basically arrive at your destination unchanged, that's pretty cool. Challenging part, A, generating sufficient numbers of neutrinos and be detecting sufficient numbers of neutrinos solve that that's an engineering problem not my department but the basics of communication can be achieved with neutrinos excellent question there from the space cadets remember you can call 888-581-0708 if you'd like to ask your questions or suggest topics live on the air otherwise i'm just going to go back to the space cadets in the live stream who who have a way more questions than I can address in the show, which is where I like to be. Now, there's a question from the very beginning. I'm scrolling through the chat live right now. I can't find the person who asked it, but you know who you are. Asking about various kinds of propulsion. I want to keep going on this propulsion theme. About various kinds of rockets, plasma rockets. You hear about, in the news, you hear about some technologies, some ideas that NASA or private entities are tossing about. Because it seems like, if you just look at modern day rockets, and we're... You know, they, they blow up and they send the blow up down the tube and then the rocket lifts off. And you're like, wow, that seems really old school. Isn't that kind of old fashioned? Haven't we thought of a fancier, flashier way of lifting heavy objects into space? I mean, we have we have smartphones now with touchscreens. Can't we do something better than blasting chemical rockets? And so you hear about cool technologies uh, like plasma rockets, uh, fusion rockets, light sails, lots of lots of cool stuff. It's cool. All right, I'll give you that. It's also largely impractical. There's a reason. We still use chemical rockets even though it's the 21st century. We still use chemical rockets a lot because they're really, really good at doing the job. They're really, really good because the, the fluid, the fuel that we use in the rocket carries with it a lot of energy. And we can take that stored energy and release it in the form of a blast and send the blast down the tube and make a rocket. So the energy source, the, the raw power that you need to run a rocket is in your fuel itself in a very efficient way. And when these rockets go off, when we mix the fuels, it's very, very easy to control the flow of the output in a very, very special way, and rockets are especially designed to control the flow of the output in this special way so that you get maximum blast. So you get maximum oomph, maximum momentum, ax maximum push. And liquid rock chemical rockets have the, just the right magic combination to do both at once. They have a lot of energy, and we can easily direct where that energy goes to make your rocket go. Now, in principle, you can make your rocket out of anything. 
You can do whatever you want, but you have to solve those two problems. Where are you going to get the energy and how are you going to efficiently squirt that energy out of a nozzle so that you can push your spaceship off the ground or push it around into space? And that turns out that is insanely complicated and that's why we don't have a lot of new fresh rocket designs even though it's 2018 21st century because it turns out that the original concepts developed by people like robert goddard over a hundred years ago was for all intents and purposes the best answer sometimes you gotta go old school to be new school, I don't know where I was going with that. I, I felt like that was going to be a clever quote to end the show, but it fell apart on me. Like a new rocket design. I should have just go, gone with a tried and true saying like the, a Rolling Stone gathers no moss, even if it makes no sense. Thank you so much to the Space Cadets for those amazing follow-up questions to the Neutrino story. And I know there's a lot of back and forth on the Mars. You can see, by the way, if you're you're just listening to the show, go on youtube.com slash Paul M. Sutter. You can see these videos of the live streams and you can see the chat embedded in the live stream so you can see the conversation that's happening around me and in a large part without me, which is the way I like it. But now it's time for the Blue Shift, and I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is the Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And I want to circle back to that Neutrino story, and I know the NASA story is a very big deal, and I'll probably be talking about it over the coming weeks. In fact, if you're listening to this live on Thursday, you can catch me on the Weather Channel at 7.20 a.m. on the AMHQ. We're going to talk about this NASA story. We're also going to talk about the sun plasma, the sun corona, the stuff we learned from the eclipse. That's 7.20 a.m. on the Weather Channel. If you're listening to this after as a podcast or on the broadcast, go to my website. I'll put the clip on my website so you can watch it there. Have a great time. Uh, so I'll talk about that story more in other venues. But I want to talk about this neutrino story because the story was basically doesn't matter, but it was hyped up to be a big deal. And I'm personally, I want to tell you, I'm personally trying to walk a very fine line because I want to call out. I don't want to say fake news because this phenomenon has been around for way longer than the term fake news. It's not necessarily fake. It's like overhyped news, misreported news, just bad news, junk news. I want to call it out because I want to show you how real science is done. Real science is messy and complicated and confusing and opaque and not clear at all. And that's great and wonderful and we love it. And that's the method, the process of science as we advance. It's very, very hard to communicate that because a lot of times there are no clear answers. But I still want you to trust like the method of science I still want you to like look up to scientists and if you meet a scientist, be like, wow, good job, scientists. I really love what you're doing. Even if I don't fully understand it, I think you're doing a good job. And and so there's this weird balance that I'm trying to walk where I want you to know the scientific method itself, the scientific enterprise itself leads to generally correct and even more correct over time descriptions of the way the world works. Any one individual result, any one individual study is subject to criticism, subject to skepticism. So one study, one report, one experiment, one result, man, you bring down the skepticism hammer hard every single time. I want you to do that. But a hundred studies, a thousand studies, a decades, centuries of results that have all led to the same conclusion, all the junk has been filtered out like water going through through sand and stone. It's all the junk is filtered out and you're left with pure, clean science. And so I'd, I'd love to explain more and I will on another show because I'm out of time for this one. 
And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by the U Department of Astronomy at The Ohio State University. Learn more at astronomy.osu.edu. It's also brought to you by you. Visit patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can contribute. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Dan Michalko for being awesome, and all the fine crew at WCB Radio for making this show possible. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Call 888-581-0708 to join me on the air. You can also follow along on the live streams. Go to spaceradioshow.com for the links. And of course, thanks again, Earthlings, for listening. I'll see you next week. And remember, science is for sharing, even when it's wrong. End of transmission. That show blazed by. Was it fast for you guys? That was fast for it me. Fast. But I was on time. About 26 minutes. Yeah. 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 Um, Greg's been getting on my case because I've been running long. Way too long. Talk, 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 Before you tear down, one promo. Coming up this Sunday, just like a billboard. Yep. Coming up this Saturday, da 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 join the space, and this, and this, and this, and this. Space Radio, Saturday at 2 on WCB. Okay. You guys get to watch me record some promos. Yeah. While you're doing that, I want you guys to think of titles. Titles for today. Then we can do those uh, Thursday specific ones next yeah. week. So think about those. Okay. We'll knock out two or three of those next week. Oh, how long is this supposed to be? 30 seconds? I wasn't thinking at all. You're recording right now, aren't you? Okay, wait, I gotta think. I gotta use, I gotta use my thinking cap here. <laughs> organic molecules on mars sterile neutrinos in space what does this even mean listen to space radio two o'clock this saturday here on wcb 90.5 fm and i can't promise you'll understand but i'll at least explain it to you does that work neutrino toast i like neutrino toast a rolling neutrino gathers no moss. I like that one, Nancy. Neutrino hype. Shifty-eyed neutrinos. Something about neutrinos. I'm like, neutrino are fertile. Almost fake news. Fake neutrinos. Mom always said, eat the neutrinos. Mama. Mama. Neutrinos, now with more calcium. With fortified neutrinos. Fortified neutrinos. <laughs> All right, we got to go because I have dinner plans. Neutrino use. I like the honey nut neutrinos. I like that too. Honey nut neutrinos. You guys keep rolling while I pack up. I like almost, I like the neutrino theme. Yeah, and don't worry, I'll be talking. I'm sure we'll talk way more about the Mars results in Weekly Space Hangout uh, next week. Uh, I will be on Weather Channel tomorrow morning at 7.20 a.m. Eastern. Uh, if you want to hear more about that story, John and Kate plus neutrinos. If you could have made that rhyme, that would have been golden. I would have gone for that if there is some clever rhyme in there. John and Kate plus fake news. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Loved all your questions, interactions on the live stream. Always a blast, both YouTube and Twitch. I love you both. And I'll see you next week.